So I want to welcome everyone. I'm Barbara Sullivan. I'm the director of Village to Village Network. And we're going to have a micro learning session today um, on introduction to pronouns. And we are very excited. Um, our board member, Emily Miller, will be doing our presentation. Um, and we'll take, I think, questions at the end, if that's OK. Um, and we'll, you know, we can either put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. We have a small group, so we'd be happy to do it more individualized. Um, we are recording this. And I ask anybody who is on the computer, if you would please just mute yourself um, at this point um, so that we give Emily our full attention. Thanks, Em. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, so I'm talking to you from Chicago. It's humid and extremely hot out today. Um, it's July day, but thanks for spending some of your time together with us. Um, I'm gonna cover an introduction to pronouns we can do an entire conference on pronouns. So really today, I just want to get a narrow scope and introduce you and give you some really best practices and core definitions. So just so you know who you're talking to, I'm Emily Miller. I'm the Director of Training and Participant Care at Access MySill Center for Independent Living out in Pennsylvania. I work remotely. I'm also a stage care trainer, which works to certify and support through best practices and training on how to support LGBT elders. And as Barbara mentioned, I'm a Village to Village Network board member. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, and we're gonna talk all about that today. Um, I can send out this presentation after because I have two links uh, and multiple resources referenced, but the two main resources I think are very helpful are pronouns.org. And NPR did a really good article in 2019 for those who maybe have an educational background to are hearing they being used for singular and might be inside saying, wait, I remember my English teacher saying something about that. So that's a really helpful article as well. All right. So I really like to talk about history um, and to bring us up to the table. So some people say, well, what are these pronouns? These are new, I haven't heard, of, I've never had to deal with this before. And I'll just say that's not necessarily true. People have been, uh, talking about pronouns for over 150 years. So the singular they goes back hundreds of years. No one, um, the quote from Jane Austen, no one can ever be in love more than once in their life. So when Jane Austen said that, gr grammarians, grammar folks, condemned it as incorrect and said that this is generic, the generic he should be used instead. Because um, the idea was that when you write, every singer has his range, that that pronoun his, would refer to both men and women, or as they sometimes put it, the masculine embraces the feminine. So we've been talking about this a while, but what's the impact? So when they moved forward in the 1970s, second wave feminists protested that the generic he, right, Eversinger has his rage, was sexist and roused a storm of indignation. They were accused of emasculating and neutering the language. So the fact is the pronoun he, it's not gender neutral. It never has been. Because think about the song by Sting. If he had sung, if you love somebody, set him free, it would have only brought the male to mind. So it, what the language required then was set them free. So what are pronouns and why do they matter? A couple of examples here. So in English, and this is many other languages as well, but in English we'll focus on today, people frequently refer to us using pronouns when speaking about us. So we're speaking about other people, speaking about others. So often pronouns have a gender implied, such as he referred to a man or a boy, or she referred to a woman or a girl, right? Barbara, she put on this Zoom today. People often make assumptions based about uh, on the gender of another person based on that person's appearance or their name. So moving forward, these assumptions aren't always correct. So when making an assumption, even if it is correct about someone's pronouns, it can send a harmful message, intentionally or not unintentionally, that people have to look a certain way to be a particular gender, right? So I say he when I see someone with short hair. I say she when I someone wearing, see someone wearing a skirt. Right? So I'm making assumptions, whether it's correct or not about that person. So using pronouns correctly or asking for pronouns, it's a way to show respect and it, it really helps to create an inclusive environment, which in our villages is something we always wanna to strive to do. 
So just as it can be offensive or harassing to make up a nickname or to make up a nickname for somebody and then call them that nickname when they don't want you to do that, it can be offensive as well or harassing to guess at someone's pronouns and refer to them using those pronouns if that's not how the person wants to be known. So choosing to ignore a person's pronouns implies that intersex, transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people do not or should not exist. So there's a lot of importance and a lot of reasons to use pronouns to be here today to talk about this further. So the name or pronoun someone goes by does not necessarily indicate anything about a person's gender or sexual orientation or any other identity, right? So we all have multiple identities, Pronouns is a way to talk about other people without using their name. So there's no one way to be a man, a woman, a transgender person, a gender not conforming person. So when you look at someone, there's no one way they should look to have X, Y, or Z pronoun. That helps. So in short, let's summarize here. The best way I like to describe what is a pronoun is pronouns are used in place of someone's name. Okay, so I got coffee with him, her, they, Emily, Veer, today. Okay, so we have a basic introduction of like, what is like the importance of pronouns kind of, the language has evolved and continues to evolve, but pronouns have always been around. Now, how do we use pronouns? So I'll give some examples. I'm gonna go through some of the most common ones and definitely there's space at the end here to talk further. So she, her. She is a writer and wrote that book herself. Those ideas are hers. I like both her and her ideas, right? So she, her, so instead of saying Emily is a writer, wrote that book herself, right? So we're replacing it with she. Same goes with he. He's a writer. He wrote that book himself. Now they, them, this is more of a gender neutral. It's more attributed to being gender neutral. They are a writer, wrote that book themselves. Those ideas are, are theirs. I like both them and their idea. So the different conjugations of they, them, theirs. You also see in this example, I use themselves, but themselves is typically acceptable as well. Okay. Now let's talk about how we pronounce these next ones. That Z is usually pronounced with a long E and uh, here in those forms of here are typically pronounced like the English word here, H-E-R-E. -E. So Z here, Z is a writer and wrote that book, He Yourself. Those ideas are here's and I like here and here ideas. So we're just really, remember I had early on the slide, if I go back to three, I've got a blank here. The pronoun fills in that space. And the pronoun can be a whole variety of pronouns. Most commonly, he, him, she, her, those are historically what we've heard, but they're not the only ones. Okay, so then you're also seeing Z here, now, some people may not use any pronouns. They're saying, Emily, what are you talking about? Well, then you just used it right there, my name. Okay, so let's use an example of my name. Just use that person's name. Emily is a writer and wrote that book. Those ideas are Emily's. I like both Emily and Emily's ideas. And you can change the sentence to have it fit more naturally for what your preference is. So Emily wrote that book unassisted instead of Emily's self, for example. Emily was the sole author of that book. Emily wrote that book, Emily's Self. So, right, we're looking at kind of a really a fill in the blank, if you will. So, some people go by multiple sets of pronouns, and usually that means that's okay to use any of the sets they go by. So, on the very first slide, I said my pronouns are she and they, both I'm comfortable with, both I feel wonderful being described by. So, both work for me. And, some people ask that others vary the pronouns that are used with certain sets of pronouns. Maybe they're trying something out. Maybe they're comfortable with the variety. That's perfect. That works for that person. Now, if you're in doubt about what that means for someone, if you want to request examples of how to do that in practice, let that person know you want to be supportive and ask that person for more information or examples so you can get it right. Okay. I do trainings on this and I promise I make mistakes too. We all will make mistakes, but you being genuinely interested, assuming positive intent and working to make sure you're supporting somebody, it goes such a long way. It really does. There's additional sets of pronouns. Again, we can have a conference on pronouns, which would be a blast, by the way. Um, 
but so there's additional sets of pronouns that some people might use. And you want to really check in with that person that goes by those pronouns. And there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's so many wonderful resources. In the beginning of the slides I mentioned, pronouns.org, this is also a link to a specific page within them that talks that through. But remember that kind of rule of thumb, the example, we don't need to overthink it. It's, you know, what are we using in place of someone's name, if not their name itself? There's a wide variety there. Now, there's a micro learning session, so I want to give you some best practices and open it up really for discussion. So best practice is to really make your default neutral. So instead of saying ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, or segregating people by gender, okay, uh, build your neutral as default, right? So siblings, parents, grown-ups, kids, if you're in a family setting or working with a family group in some way. Otherwise, you're addressing it at a volunteer appreciation event. Hello, friends, people. Hey, everybody, listen up. We're going to make our way over here. Folks, thanks for joining today. So there's so many insert the blanks here you can use. It does take a bit of practice. Um, so try those neutral terms as a way to just build an inclusive environment from the start. Next. I really have four key points here. Put them all on one slide, I hope that's not too much, but really the key point, just always use that person's name and their pronouns that they've shared with you, um, use that. So Emily had a presentation today, um, they were kind of boring. That's okay, you can say that. Um, so use that person's name, use their pronouns. If you are having a hard time, you're like that's um, for me, just it's not what I'm understanding, I'm having a hard time remembering, um, that's on you to practice. I'll talk about some ways to practice because it can very much be a habit change. Number two, apologize if you make a mistake. Spoiler alert, you will. It's going to happen. We are human. Um, it, it happens. Again, if you are making a genuine effort to support someone, you're not intentionally using incorrect pronouns, right? You're trying to make a habit change and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so sorry. Move on. But it, uh, you don't need to make a big deal out of the apology because then it can make it about you, right? So say, I'm sorry. So let's say my example, I got coffee with him yesterday. I got coffee with them yesterday. And it, I got a latte and, you know, I think the milk was spoiled. So moving on, address, recognize, own, and move forward. Number three, be consistent. So um, this means when you are with, let's say you have a new member in your village okay, and you're in the room with them, you're talking to them. Um, so I'm using the pronouns that they identify with. When they leave, I continue to do so. So when somebody's in the room, when they're not in the room, when in any setting, written, verbal, et cetera. The next I would say is ask everyone's pronouns not just the people you're quote unquote not sure about, right? This is also a really good way to be an ally. We ask this of everyone. So, in, you know, maybe you're going through your intake forms and you ask, hey, what are your pronouns? What do you mean? I'm a man. Can't you tell? You're, this is ridiculous. We ask this of everyone. So this is a baseline that's done with every single person. So we make sure we are inclusive. So we make sure we're respecting you because everyone has pronouns. Everyone can identify and say what those are. Just like everyone has a gender, everyone has a sexual orientation, etc. And share your own pronouns, right? Again, so because we all have them, or some people might say use my name instead, um, that, that's their pronouns, that's their preference and their identity. So share yours as well. Put it in the tagline, the easiest I'd say, put it in the tagline of your email. And it always shows up in every signature you have. And number four, you know, nothing will change unless you practice, right? Make this part of your habit. I think I shared this on a previous call. So I, I have kids, uh, one of which is in the room right behind me being very quiet. I'm very proud of her. Um, and the best thing I do to practice is when I'm reading a book. So um, I'm reading a book and I ask the character, what are your pronouns? Okay, thank you. I love you. No matter what your pronouns are. And maybe the next time I read it, those pronouns change. And maybe this person I've always associated in my head with he, him pronouns, and now they're she, her. And I'm reading this book saying, okay, hold on. Well, I got to slow down these sentences 
because I'm wanting to say he, him. Okay, so human uh, habit, right? So let's change our brains, let's practice. So that's a very tangible way to practice uh, is in any type of storytelling you're doing. Any storytelling, any stories you're reading, change the pronouns. Maybe you're watching a movie, you know, when you're reading a script, anything like that in the theater, change the pronouns. Make them opposite of what your brain might you know, automatically associate. Another way to practice is with animals and dogs. You know, oh, what a good boy. You're a very good dog. Um, and I do not mean this to demean in any way, um, but it is a really good practice. We so often say good boy. And so changing that to good dog. So again, going back to that idea of using neutral as a default for your playing field. So that's one way I'd also say. I think together we can come up with more ideas to practice as well. I really want to stress, though, that language is, it is always evolving. So pronouns are not new, and language is always evolving. So when you are working with a volunteer, a member, and maybe they say something that you haven't heard before, you haven't heard those pronouns before, you can say, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that word, that term, that pronoun. Do you mind telling me what it is, what it means to you, and if it's a word you would like our staff to use as well? So we're getting permission, we're um, asking, and we are following up too on our word. If you want us to use that, we will. Okay, so what questions do you have? We can talk through this more. I really wanted, again, it's really a primer, basic introduction. Um, so talk to me, what questions do you have or examples? I'll open up the chat as well. Anybody and feel free to, you know, raise your hand if you know how to do that or just hail a couple of you or on no microphone, no video. Um, everybody's muted at this point. Um, so feel free to just kind of hail us and, and we will. There's a, oh, that's them. Um, you know, be happy to, Emily's here. Eddie? Um, first of all, thank you, Emily. Wonderfully done. And I had to give her, <clears throat> give they crudo, kudos because they taught me about pronouns in a private lesson once. But I, I just wanted to raise the gender neutral stuff, the importance of that, because for years I have cringed at the word manpower. We don't have the manpower for it. And it's like, are you talking in staff? Is that what you're saying? Or you don't have the volunteers for it? It's it's using language that is not offensive to people. And, and and this is a race thing, but another one that just drives me crazy is white papers. They always have to be white papers, you know. But anyway, that's it. I just wanted to thank you and say try to be more objective in our language. Good point. Um, Eddie, you bring up a really good point. So these efforts we're making they cross identities. Any effort you make to be inclusive typically benefits multiple groups, right? So when we make things more inclusive, it helps more people be seen, heard, and validated. Um, so we have one question here. Um, what can we do if a member expresses, expresses resistance or pushback to using pronouns? So the very first thing I like to do is replace pronouns with any other let's say an identity based. What, if, what can we do if a member expresses resistance or pushback to, um, uh, to, to, to gay people would be the easiest, I almost want to replace it with, okay? So part of it is how, thinking about, in a way, what is your policy and your manuals and rules and regulations? So that's gonna be the more like red tape side of things. In this village, in our organization, in this house, you know, our values are this. We make sure every single member feels seen, heard, and validated. Their identity is their own, and we respect that. And here's how we do this. We have no tolerance for misgendering, where I um, am, you know, Emily just gave this presentation, and uh, he did a horrible job. Okay. Um, we, can, we can say this presentation, your opinions about it, without misgendering me, right, and putting, uh, making me the butt of that because that's harmful um so i would add so i would say that part of it is about your policies your values and really your anti-bullying 
Okay, so we want to make sure no discrimination is occurring. Um, and it, I think there's opportunity for education, right? Everybody has an identity. Um, there, in, intersex people exist. Gender nonconforming people exist. Transgender people exist, just as men and women also exist. So when we do not, uh, people push back. We can say your um, a person's opinion doesn't make somebody's existence no longer exist. Um, so I think we can think of more ideas together as well. But um, I think the core thing is there's opportunity for education and assuming positive intent. If this is new to somebody, they might be overwhelmed and their first reaction is like, why do we have to do this, right? This is another thing for me to remember. Um, but what an opportunity to get to know somebody, right? A lot, big part of villages is community and we wanna make sure that all community is included and valued. Emily, you have a question in the chat. Okay, perfect. So um, I've got, um, so I can read this out. Do you want me to okay, read it? Okay, so I've got, you go ahead and read it because I have another one on my docket as well that I'll, you go oh, ahead and okay. read Barbara. So mm -hmm. Lois said, our village presented a program similar to this for our membership last year and also developed it and posted a tutorial on pronouns on our website. We are now looking for follow-up ideas and wonder what additional members villages are using to continue to support comfort in this area. That's great. Thanks, Lois. Yeah. There's and unlimited Lois, what, what village are you with, Lois? You're on you're on mute. Um Penn's Village in Philadelphia. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, well, first, Philly has every single year the Trans Health Conference that's always hosted in Philly, um, which is an incredible, wonderful um, group. So I should um, chat that out to the group. It's the, 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 um, the Philadelphia Trans Health Conference. Um, so it's a huge educational free event um, that is annual. I don't know if it's been annual with COVID, what that's looked like. But in terms of local, I would absolutely sync up with them and see if you can have a table or any type of sponsorship. It doesn't have to be financial sponsorship. I'm sure there's opportunities to just have mutual support because that presence oftentimes just saying, hey, I'm at a pride event. I'm at the Trans Health Conference. We post pronouns at all times in our email signatures. That is such a way to show up because oftentimes when you're building an alliance and a partnership, you need to show up first before it becomes a bit more reciprocal to build trust with that community. So that's the Philly Trans Health Conference. It's actually today and tomorrow mm -hmm. and Friday. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, I know, I just looked it up. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, if you can send out the link. I, I've been before and it's not, you do not have to live in Philly to as a requirement to attend. It's fantastic. Um, so that's, that's one. So partnering, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I said that earlier. Um, so partnering with your local organizations. Now I'll note that, um, you know, when you think about the LGBT movement, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, you'll notice that T is at the end. T wasn't always there in terms of being represented, but they were the transgender people were the ones who started um, Stonewall, who were the ones who started the LGBT rights movement. So sometimes and often, there is still transphobia, so fear uh, or hatred of transgender people, gender nonconforming people within the lesbian, gay, bisexual com community, queer community. That's absolutely still the case. So that's why, again, I kind of wanted to stress that gender identity and expression and sexual orientation are separate identities and thus come with different historical um, implications. Um, so let's go. Um, so Lois, partnership, um, email signatures. There's also, just last week was, I believe, non-binary, International Non-Binary People's Day. October is LGBT History Month. I think May is LGBT Older Adults Month. June is Pride. So there's a lot of opportunities in, and within uh, identity-based months and ce celebrations uh, that you can uh, celebrate as well. 
So I think that's a good We have a blog, a monthly blog that has to do with inclusiveness and diversity. And it's that committee that sponsored this um, program. But um, we did celebrate for one of those months, I forget which one it was, but our our readings and resources in our blog that month were uh, addressed to that area. So thank you. But I didn't realize there were so many opportunities. So this is great. There are. And, um, you know, I think that's something also to share as you come up with more as, as you do these partnerships to share that. Um, there's so many resources out there, both locally and nationally. So SAGE has a lot of good best practices as well. So we talk about ways to support people. And part of that is also in your paperwork, um, your job applications, your advertisements. So it's one thing to say we're a safe space and have a rainbow. Um, but what's the difference between having a program, for example, on the rainbow flag, the trans flag, disability pride flag, the, the there's just a program I would love to attend on all the various flags and representation in both gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, so continue those discussions. You know that it's an ongoing effort and language continues to change. So Lois, thank you for what you're doing there. Now, there's a couple more questions. One I wanna go back to and address this was a direct one to me. How can you deal with the idea that, you know, we, we don't have members that use different pronouns, different be, meaning I'm gonna assume not he or not she, so they, um, Z here, for example. So why should we care? And the first, I wanna talk about um, outing, so being outed. Um, so I had somebody come out to me saying, you know, I'm, I'm I'm trans, I use they, them pronouns. And if it is such a privilege and joy to have that shared with you, I will first say. Uh, that means that that person trusts you or finds safety and security in you. So what that also means is there's many people who may not feel comfortable sharing. So Lois, you might be doing all the best programming and the best things out there. And people who have lived an entire life or generations of people saying it's not okay to be outside the box in any way, they may never come out. Right. And that there is no, there should never feel pressure to come out. We never want to pressure anyone. So what that means is we might only see people who are comfortable being out. So if someone says, I've never met a trans person, well then let's crack that and say, you've never met an out trans person, but trans people are everywhere. People who use they, them pronouns, are everywhere. They just might not feel comfortable in that setting or that environment or being out. I hope that helps. Um, so that's what I might say to somebody is um, we have to care about it because um, they're a part of our community, whether or not they feel comfortable being out or not. Another question I see here, Barbara, thank you for sending that. Um, I love that that's this weekend. <laughs> um, so I noticed you mentioned that a person's pronouns do not necessarily imply anything about a person's gender. So in general, do you recommend educating about pronouns separately from education about educating about gender? Or do you often link the two topics if there's time to do so? So in most of the trainings I do, you, I feel it's important to, to do a vocabulary check, right? We say LGBT, we say pronouns with gender identity, um, Gender, uh, gender identity and expression, you might see, um, what is it? Um, SOGI, S-O-G-I, sexual orientation and gender identity. I'm chatting that out. So SOGI. So, so often uh, we historically link sexual orientation, gender identity, we, we kind of lump them together. Um, and we, we might historically think all of those struggles are very similar and intertwined. And there are themes that are cut across both identities. Um, so I do typically when I'm doing a, a vocabulary, I wanna make sure everyone's on the same understanding. You know, what, is, what do you mean when you say the word identity or when you say the word lesbian, queer, bisexual, um, gender nonconforming? Because pronouns and language is how we show respect. Language is how we show respect to people. So in order to do so, I do typically talk about both um, before you can go any further. Because if we're not on the same understanding of our terms and our labels and our, what we used to describe ourselves, then we, um, we can't go deeper than that. So I hope that answers your question. 
Okay, so I'm going to keep scrolling down unless there's any verbal questions. I had a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me okay? I can. Go ahead. It's Leo Sanchez. And um, I was a census, and I, I, two, two points. Point one, I was a census enumerator in 2000 and presented at a door. And the person that opened the door was a very large African American gentleman, probably in his mid 40s. And part of the questions that I was required to ask, if I remember correctly, was what pronouns do they use? Because this was a new thing that was added to the census. And when I asked that question, he kind of looked at me like I had three heads. So I am bringing this up because not every, I mean, I might be all excited about, oh, I'm going to be sensitive to you and use your pronouns, blah, 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 blah. And other people are not necessarily there yet. So as you suggested, Emily, I just kind of moved on because I wasn't going to engage with, with this person about what, I, what it was I was asking, but he was really looking at me as like, really, you're asking me that question. You can clearly see what I am, what gender I am. So I just wanted to share that as a, as a way of, this is real world, okay? Yeah. Real world. You're, and, you're and, Go ahead. So, uh, just yes, and that's the exact example. I think that just when you're meeting with a new member and they might look at you and say, what do you mean my pronouns? Can't you tell, right? And so that's where it goes back to trying to be, we ask everyone this uh, pronouns and make it very simple. Pronouns are what we use instead of your name. So I, I knocked on his door today. Sound right? Move it on, right? Um, but you're absolutely right, Leo. Sometimes you're gonna get a little pushback. So I would encourage you in your volunteer orientations or um, you know, in your programming or uh, your staff or any of your core representatives of your village, role play through that. What would you say? And um, so you have some practice. So if and when that does happen, more often when that happens, you've heard it once before. So the shock isn't necessarily there, but you might be muscle memory. Oh, okay. Okay. So Leo and I, we kind of, we, we talked about that before. So what should I say? Because it's going to happen. It will happen. And so how do you move forward and make it part of your, your default? Thank you, Leo, it's a good example. And, and one quick follow-up uh, on a separate topic, Emily. Does mm -hmm. this notion of pronouns also translate to other languages? For example, I am a Spanish speaker and every word, nearly every word has a definite masculine or feminine form and on top of that, sometimes there are exceptions, like el dia would be the day, which wrong, wrong pronoun for dia, but it's an exception. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this notion of pronouns. If I was a Spanish speaker or mm -hmm. any other language, that's, I mean, like you were talking about language is very different depending, and, and, and for English, it's very convenient for us to say, one gender, another gender, and then there's this middle ground that is not really anything. But I think most of the world's languages are masculine or feminine in terms, or many, I should not say most, but many of these languages do have these innate masculine or feminine forms. And what is your experience on trying to, how do those people that speak those languages manage this issue about dealing with pronouns? Absolutely. So um, I speak German. My child goes to a German preschool. They make fun of me all the time that her German is better than mine, as it should be. She's there like seven hours a day. So uh, in German, you know, their table, the male table. Um, why? Right. The, the table has no gender. So, yes, this is across multiple languages. Der, die, das, the, the, the. But each one has a different male, female, neutral. Um, so I've attended a really interesting workshop by the German consulate, um, really so affiliate of them, on how do you teach, like how do you teach basic German, but also introduce neutral pronouns because it changes the entire structure or endings of adjectives completely. So you have a lot of really interesting examples there uh, or interesting case scenarios. So um, a good one, for example, is how people say Latinx. 
for Latina, Latino, and then Latinx. But X is not at all reflective of the language. And it's a very, like, a white person said, let's give this solution. Um, so, Leo, first I'll preface that I do not have an answer for you. Um, <laughs> and second, because if I did, I somebody should know about it, but I don't. <laughs> um, so it really depends on the language you're speaking of, because language is embedded also in culture. And so if you think about the laws, the culture, the... Um, how language is used, the context is different. So what might fly in one country with a language that has um, a more of a, a romantic based language or more fluid, let's say, or, or a, a different cultural implication versus a different one. Um, it partially depends on the culture um, and what's permissible almost or what it means, because it might be so tied that if you can't even, um, the, your sexual orientation can't be anything other than straight, uh, typically it's even more difficult or um, oppressive of an environment to then also challenge gender norms. So I would say each language is approaching it differently. And Leo, I'm going to look up, um, Duolingo actually had a really interesting uh, article about this. Duolingo is an app for learning languages uh, on your phone or computer. And they did a really interesting that exact question, what, is, what do pronouns look like in different languages? Um, and it's different. So, yeah, no answer for you, but also answer. Hope that was helpful. Thank you. Yes. Emily, just for, for Leo's sake, uh, showing my age, I use Facebook occasionally, and I've started to notice some of my relatives in other countries and Spanish-speaking countries starting to use pronouns but I haven't seen it enough to figure it out. I did, however, read something in an email in Spanish and it sounded like they were doing exactly what is being done in English. So I heard, I, as I was reading it, I start, my mind started blowing as they were using they and them in a singular fashion. And I had to stop myself and say, okay, I, I think I know what they're doing here, but I think it's starting to happen, but again, I don't know the consistency of it. And I think it kind of goes back to the question earlier of like, why should we care about this? Right? We've never taught, had to deal with this before. And again, that notion being, well, people who use pronouns maybe aren't in your everyday language have always existed. Um, but now there's some sense of safety or enough pushback to feel comfortable saying, I'm claiming my space, right? To say I do exist. So. It's not that this hasn't existed, but we're getting pushback. Maybe there's more access to education. There's a whole variety of factors. So I think it's an exciting time to see this become more mainstream at the same time when this is mainstream, there's a lot of mis misinformation. And I do think there's a role for villages to, to, in creating safe spaces um, with everything going on in the world right now, specifically in the United States. Um, anything we could do to create safety for our members, our volunteers, people we serve in our communities will only benefit us all. What other questions are there? I just want to make a comment. I think it's a great segue to look at your volunteer orientation and really start with that. I love that idea. Um, you know, and even looking at as simple as, you know, as a former ED, our handbooks and, you know, how they're laid out and, and you know whether it's the volunteer handbook or the member handbook and really go through them and review uh, to make them you know up to uh, speed on some of the pronouns but you know getting in the practice like you said Emily um, so and well, that serves as a great good idea good with the MOUs yeah MOUs handbooks uh, orientations powerpoints it's very good practice because you're literally doing a grammar exercise. Again, you're, if, if you think about any language course you've taken, uh, fill in the blank. So volunteers should not use his or her car. Um, volunteers should not use their car, whatever your policy is, right? You're, you're genuinely doing a fill in the blank and using the most neutral uh, pronoun for that description. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Oh, 
Sophia just said, I think it's also fine to do he, she, her, they as an add-on instead of just neutral. I, I figured that out, Sophia. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're in good company. Um, yeah, I, I know that um, people might be fearful, like it's kind of this joke that in both tech is the, uh, the Midwest bisexual, lesbian, gay, uh, transgender ally college conference. And we call it the alphabet soup conference because there's so many acronyms for all the identities we want to make sure we include. So again, any effort you make to be inclusive of one identity typically helps all. So if you're fearful of leaving one out, go with the most generic. Um, they is neutral and it's more of an umbrella. And kind of going back to the very first example of um, he is not an inclusive language, like um, a lot of mankind um, using, you know, all men are created equal. Like, so I know that the intention may be different at the time, um, but we, these things are not necessarily in practice neutral. So um, it's a good, a good idea to, to look through your forms, your paperwork, your email, et cetera, to see, you know, what, what are the link, what is the language that we're using and how can we kind of make it our baseline more inclusive just from the get go? Cause that will be noticed. Um, putting up a rainbow safe space sticker, um, for transgender folks or people who are gender non-conforming may not uh, fill the ticket because historically, even within the LGBT community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community, there's still an abundance of transphobia. Um, so I hope that helps a bit. Mm -hmm. So one question, how can a village deal with pushback from leadership specifically about taking any of these actions? Okay, I love this question. Um, so the first thing I'll say is um, there are best practices out there for a reason. They're to make sure you are doing the best practices, supporting your membership, retaining your members, um, and working in an inclusive manner. So um, much of this is evidence-based, peer-reviewed, um, and there are resources out there showing that you know when you use inclusive language, at, at its most, to put it in one sentence, you are preventing suicide. Um, I don't want to mean that in any light way. That's exactly what you're doing. Um, so you are making people feel seen, heard, and valued. So you can kind of say like, I'll give an example. I was working somewhere and there was resistance to putting signatures in, um, in the, putting pronouns in the signatures that didn't really align with branding. So when you, you know, you did hire me on and part of what I'm here to do is give best practices that are tried and true in this field. And as an expert in this field or as somebody who's taken training or, or what this resource says here, which is the national leading, so for SAGE, the LGBT Center on Aging, um, all of their evidence shows to do this. And this is what would be the best practice. So I would kind of push, use a very evidence-based approach and say, if we want to be um, a leader in this field, of serving older adults and to serve older adults, we should do this in the in evidence-based approach. Here are the resources and this is why I'm doing this. Um, I'd also say build up your build up allies. So it should not necessarily come from one person. We know in community organizing, multiple voices has more of an impact, the use of personal stories, but it also doesn't need to be, we don't wanna put the burden on anyone in the population that's historically marginalized to have to have that uh, the, the burden of caring thing, this needs to happen because that can easily be sloughed off and say, well, that's, that's just Eddie on his soapbox. You know, you know, Eddie, right. And I do know Eddie and it's a great soapbox. That being said, um, building allyship, it is incredible to see, um, what can happen when you get someone who is, um, fits every box of what society says a masculine person should look like who puts their pronouns in their email and says, hey, this is important. That speaks volumes. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? Anything that you'd like to add that I've missed? Oh, everybody good? This has been a great micro-learning session. I mean, tons of information, Emily. 
kudos. Great, great, great. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Um, and obviously this is recorded, but we will share, if that's okay with you, Emily, the mm -hmm. PowerPoint um, yeah. and slides. And um, like Emily had said, there were a couple of reference points in there. So um, <laughs> you can grab those. Um, and there's our email. Yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm been really impressed with the Village to Village Network Task Force on this well. So thank you to the network for, for prioritizing this as a topic to talk about because the educational programs or the programs you choose to put on also reflects your values uh, and who in your community um, you see is, is, is part of your community. So thank you for putting on this topic because uh, to that question, um, getting leadership involved is just critical. So thank you everybody for being here. And, if you have any I'm questions. learning. Yes. I'm learning. I, I'm apologizing along the way, but I'm learning. It's a learning curve. I'm learning too. That's the thing too. Remember, no one person holds all this wisdom. It's first too much to carry. And second, we cannot do it alone. So thank you, everybody. And Sophia put in, um, yeah, the LGB best practices toolkit for villages. Thank you. It's fantastic. Um, there's so many resources out there. So if you need any direction and getting you put in the right place, uh, please reach out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Stay cool. <laughs> Stay cool. And hydrated. And hydrated. <laughs>